Bonjour et bienvenue à l'ILARA, l'Institut des langues rares de l'École pratique des hautes études PSL. Hello and welcome to ILARA, our institute, whose aim is to showcase the rare and precious ancient and contemporary languages of the world. Bruna, Bruna Franchetto's talk will be in English, but I'll introduce our institute in French first. ILARA est un institut créé en août 2020 par arrêté du ministère français de l'enseignement supérieur, de la recherche et de l'innovation. Sa mission est de sensibiliser et former le grand public aux langues rares, anciennes et contemporaines, et à leur culture. ILARA participe aussi à la valorisation et la sauvegarde de ces langues à travers des actions de documentation. Deux offres principales sont actuellement disponibles pour tous les publics. D'une part, une offre de cours de l'éducation, de découverte et d'approfondissement en présentiel à Paris, et étant donné la situation en visioconférence, vous y trouverez par exemple du maya classique, des langues des monts Nuba, des pas classiques, des langues en ligne. D'autre part, une offre de vidéoconférence virtuelle, l'ILARA en ligne, disponible sur notre chaîne et dont la première série, les invitations de l'ILARA, met à l'honneur des spécialistes de renommée internationale sous forme d'entretien ou de conférences. Dans ce cadre de l'ILARA en ligne, nous avons accueilli il y a un mois Scott Delancé qui nous a fait découvrir les subtilités des langues d'Asie. Il y a trois semaines, c'était Nick Evans qui nous initiait aux complexités de la langue aborigène d'Alabon d'Australie. Il y a deux semaines, Félix Ameka qui nous présentait quelques joyaux linguistiques des langues d'Afrique de l'Ouest. Et la semaine dernière, nous découvrions la diversité linguistique du Caucase avec Bernard Conway. Ce soir, nous allons en Amérique du Sud au bord du fleuve Chingu, où sont parlées des langues caribes. Les Kuipuro, dont il va s'agir aujourd'hui, sont un peuple autochtone d'Amazonie, connu pour ses arts musicaux incroyablement riches. Ce sont ces profondeurs que Bruna Franchetto nous invite à explorer avec elle ce soir. Professeur au département de linguistique et d'anthropologie de l'Université fédérale de Rio de Janeiro, où elle a obtenu son doctorat d'anthropologie sociale en 1986, Mona Franquetto s'intéresse à la description, l'analyse et la documentation des langues minoritaires, en particulier les langues amérindiennes, ainsi qu'à la traduction, à la genèse et l'impact de l'écriture et de l'alphabétisation sur les langues maternelles. Elle travaille sur le multilinguisme, les politiques et idéologies linguistiques, la relation entre langue et musique dans les chansons et la parole chantée, les arts verbaux et la revitalisation linguistique. Elle coordonne notamment avec l'anthropologue Carlo Fausto le projet de Documenta Kuro en collaboration avec l'association autochtone de Kuro et le collectif des Sa présentation aujourd'hui portera principalement sur les arts verbaux musicaux de ce peuple autochtone du sud de l'Amazonie. N'hésitez pas à lui poser vos questions en français ou en anglais à travers le chat en direct. Hola, bienvenido a todos, buenas noches. Welcome to you all, and please ask your questions in the live chat, share your comments and participate. We'll gather your questions and ask them to Bruna at the end of her presentation. Bruna, we're thrilled that you accepted Ilara's invitation to present the verbal musical arts of the Kukuro to the general public. And her first, some of them, some of their fascinating features, their exceptional complexity, and show us the window they open on the relationship between music and language. We are all ears. So good night to everybody. Good afternoon in Brazil. And I'm very grateful to the organizer of Ilara seminar for the invitation, which I hope to honor. So just a few seconds in order to share my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I need this host disabled participant screen sharing. What I have to do? Oh, I'm sorry. Going to, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to give you that. Uh, sorry. There you go. Now you can share it. Sorry for that. Okay. Thank you.
It's okay? Yes. So first of all, uh, a necessary homage, homage, homage. That is, I need to do to all the guardians of languages, knowledges, and memories of the First Nation peoples taken by COVID-19 in Brazil and South America. Uh, more than 800 uh, indigenous people, old, um, uh, mostly the old people, died uh, by COVID-19 in these pandemics. And it is a great loss. So this presentation is a fluid sequence. So follow me, if you please. I begin, I begin with some information about Brazil's indigenous people, a poorly known situation, perhaps a necessary background. I'm going to present population demographic data that is, that is out of date, that are, that are out of date having been extracted from the last census, national census, Brazilian census, conducted in 2010. So uh, in 2010, the, in the Brazilian census counted uh, almost 900,000 uh, indigenous people in Brazil, 1.4% uh, of the total population. Uh, 57 uh, living in indigenous territories in protected area, 36% in urban areas, and 7% in rural areas. But we, we must consider that the demo demographic growth in Brazil's indigenous people is twice that of the non-indigenous people population. So, we have a growth of more than 200%. So possibly now we have more than 1 million indigenous people in Brazil. And also we must, we, it can be observed that the indigenous contingent that lives in urban areas, in towns, especially, especially in Amazonia, is rapidly increasing if we observe the last 10 years. Uh, in five, five centuries ago, when the European invaders come to the Atlantic coast of what uh, now we call Brazil, it is estimated that more than 1,000 uh, ethnic groups lived in Brazilian territories probably between two and four million people and probably about 600 languages. So we, the last in five cent, uh, century of colonization of invasion uh, by the European intruders is a loss, a very great loss, populational, cultural and linguistic loss, more than 80% of indigenous people died or disappeared. Uh, and if you want, this is a reproduction of the ethno-historical map uh, done by the known uh, German ethnographer, Kurt Nimuendajou, and published it in 1944. And it's possible to, uh, to, to see, to have, to download, download this map, the ethno-historical map of Putin Wendajou in the site uh, uh, that we have here in this, in this last slide. Uh, in this, this is a picture, uh, a colorful picture of the complete indigenous occupation uh, of, of the, the Brazilian territory, the South America, most South American uh, territory. And the different colors uh, Kurtin Wendajou uh, used uh, is in, in indicate the different uh, macro families and families 
of uh, the indigenous languages, just to have a visual impact uh, of the linguistic and cultural and ethnic diversity. So if this is the, the landscape, linguistic cultural uh, landscape of the diversity in, 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 in this uh, place of, of the world, five century ago, more than five century ago, this is the situation today. In green, you have, uh, you can see the, the indigenous territories in Brazil. When we, we say indigenous territories, we mean protected area, officially protected area. Uh, so if you can, I try to, to indicate with my cursor, you have a concentration of medium big indigenous territory in mostly in, in Amazonia area. Here, almost invisible, but are small uh, indigenous territories in exactly in the Eastern and Southern uh, parts of, of Brazil, uh, where the, where the, the impact of invasion of colonization was more, was more brutal and more rapid. So there is like a, a, a white uh, emptiness in this region and the concentration of indigenous people and areas and territories in the north and west, uh, then in northern and western Amazonia in the southern Amazonia, here in central Brazil. And we will go here in this place, but wait a little bit more. Well, well interesting thing is that if we ask how many indigenous languages in Brazil exist today? Well, we have uh, like what I call the dance of numbers so we have very different uh, numbers. The census of 2010 uh, say that we have 274 languages. Ariel Rodriguez, uh, a known uh, Brazilian linguist, uh, said 180 languages. And the linguist of the Museu Paraense Emilio Gildi uh, leaded by the linguist Danny Moore, say that we have no more, between 150 and 160 different, different languages. The problem is what is understood by language. You know? So we still need more investigation, especially sociolinguistic diagnostics in order to uh, have a more precise number of how many languages still survive in Brazil, but certainly none less than 150. The problem of this different number come uh, because there is no uh, 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 clear uh, differentiation between languages and dialects or languages varieties. There are no clear distinction between languages and ethnic groups. And there is no uh, recog recognition, explicit recognition of the so-called sleeping languages or reclaimed languages. Uh, this means uh, languages considered extinct or dying and that uh, are now reclaimed by many indigenous people in Brazil, especially those still living in the uh, east, northeastern and eastern part of Brazil uh, along the uh, Atlantic coast. Even so, the diversity, the linguistic and cultural diversity in, Brazil, in the indigenous Brazil is impressive. So we have two macro families, Tupi and Macro G, uh, with nine families in 58 languages, and more in total 40 families, linguistic families, 
and certainly more than 10 isolated languages. And this picture is also suggesting, suggestive. Uh, it was done by the linguist Marcus Maia in 2006, just to have an idea of this, this linguistic diversity, enormous linguistic diversity of indigenous languages in Brazil still survive in the diversity. Uh, so we have here the two macro families or stock, Tupi and macro G, the Tupi in green with the old families inside the, the Tupi stock and in green, the families with each family with its languages of the macro G stock. And even so we have other family, very important, the Ar Arawak family, language with, there's no older language, the Arawak languages, most of them here in, in, in blue. So we have uh, the Carib family. We will speak about Carib here. The Arawak family, the Maku family, the Tucano family, the Yanomami family, the Pano family, the Nambiquara family, the Chapacura family, the Krenak family, uh, and the Mura family. So just to, to, to contemplate, to observe, to appreciate this, this fantastic linguistic diversity, and I emphasize still existing, still surviving inside the Brazilian territory. So this is another picture just to uh, uh, show how the geographical distribution. So we have in, in, in red here, uh, G, G languages in, in this yellow, brown, Carib languages. And so, but the distribution once more is more dense in the Amazonia region, you see? So in the north, west, Southwest, southern Amazonia. It's some here uh, at south. This long line here, it's uh, the, the Guarani speaking people, the Guarani languages, the Tupi Guarani languages, Tupi Guarani languages that are uh, uh, still existing with many, many, many thousands of speakers still today. So we will go to one of the three better known multilingual, multi-ethnic system of the Amazon, in the Amazon, that still, still survives almost in its entirety. One uh, multilingual and multi-ethnic multi regional system is the Upper Xingu in the state of Mato Grosso. We are almost at the center of Brazil, the heart of Brazil. This, we will go here. We will go to the Upper Xingu. But the second one, the Southern Amazonia, you see the concentration of linguistic and cultural diversity, diversity in South Amazonia in the state of Rondonia. Brazil is a federation of states state of Rondonia. And the third one, maybe the well known, is the Upper Rio Negro in Northwestern Amazonia, uh, the border with uh, Colombia. So these are the three still surviving uh, regional multi-ethnic and multilingual system in Amazonia. These systems were a rule uh, in, in prehistoric and historical times at the beginning of colonization and were disrupted by the colonization, by the invasion and by the genocide uh, that indigenous people suffered for 500 century. So let me take you all to the Xingu, specifically to the upper Xingu one of, of, of the three uh, multilingual, multi-ethnic Amazonian system. Mm. 
we are at the center of Brazil, at the heart of Brazil. At the edge of Southern Brazilian Amazonia, the Xingu indigenous land on te or territory is a protected area of 2002 square kilometers. A population around 2,000 people distributed across 25 main and satellite villages participate in a complex network of exchange in which each local group or village maintains its territorial, political, and linguistic identity in a dynamic equilibrium between factional conflicts and peaceful interaction. This is true, what I'm saying is true for the southern part of the Xingu indigenous territory, this, this part, uh, known as Upper Xingu. Really here is the multilingual and multi ethnic regional system where we have, so this is the Upper Xingu. You see, exactly this part. The Upper Xingu is this uh, headwater regions uh, uh, drawn by the tribut, southern tributaries that form the Rio Xingu, the Xingu River, that is one of the main southern tributaries of the Amazonian River. So we are exactly in this southern part of this indigenous territory. In this southern part is known as Apu Xingu. A zoom on the Upper Xingu in the east. Uh, this is the eastern part of the Upper Xingu where the Kerry people live along the Rio Kuluene. The Rio Kuluene, that is one of these southern uh, uh, head, the, the, the headwaters of the Rio Xingu, the Rio Xingu that begins here. So we are, we are going to this region. And we are going to this village, Ipatsi. All these are villages of Carib speaking peoples of the Upper Shingu. So I said that this is a multilingual and multi ethnic regional system where languages belonging to the three major linguistic groups of South American neotropics in one linguistic isolate are spoken by around uh, nowadays 3,000 people. So we have the Arawak, uh, Wauja, Meinaku, Yawalapiti, uh, uh, are speakers of an Arawak languages uh, here. The Carib here. Uh, are four uh, uh, groups, Kuikuru, Kalapalo, Nafukwa, and Matipu. And the two P here are Kamayura and Aweti, that are uh, speakers of a Tupi uh, Guarani, uh, uh, of Tupi Guarani languages. And then here at the edge, in the northern edge, an isolate languages, Trumai. So just, just to see. What, what it means, multilingual regional systems. So just remember that all these groups participate in this complex network of exchange in which each local group or village maintains its territorial, political, linguistic identity in, with a dynamic equilibrium between factional conflicts and especially peaceful interaction. The Kuikuru inhabit the, uh, the Kuikuru speak, the Kuikuru, we are going to one of these Carib speaking upper Xinguan people, the Kuikuru, that inhabit the southeastern part of the upper Xingu. This is the traditional, they are traditional territory since the, at, at least the second half of the 16th century and the denomination, the denomination Kuikuru derives from the toponym of the, for the place where in the middle of 18th century, the first Kuikuru village 
was erected as the residence of a recognized autonomous member of the Apu Shingo system. 600 Kwikuru live today in six villages along the Kulue, Kuluene River, as I said. The Kwikuru speak a dialect of the Apu Shingo Carib language. Uh, one of the two southern branch of the uh, uh, Carib family. So we have here the last classification, genetic classification of, in the, of the Carib, of languages in the Carib family, of the branch uh, of the Carib linguistic family. And so you see that the Kuikuru and other uh, Carib Apochingwan people uh, speak one of the two southern branch, né? of the southern branch uh, uh, of the Carib family. Southern means south, um, south of Amazonia, south of Sh uh, Shingu River. Upper Shingu dialects or varieties, Upper Shingu Carib dialects or variety are distinguished mainly by different prosodic structures. There are two principal varieties, on one side, that's spoken by the Kuikuru and the Wadihut. On the other side, the variety spoken by Kalapalo, Nahuqua, and the new Machupu. Being that every variety is in turn subdivided in sub-varieties. So we have here an example uh, of many, many, many present in all, in all South Amazonia, in all indigenous language of so-called micro diversity. It means that each language is, is, contains different varieties, dialectical varieties. So we have a macro diversity and also micro diversity that must be considered. So this is the, I, this is the, 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 the upper Shunga Carib language uh, uh, is, is one language from the linguistic point of view but uh, really people spoke two varieties or dialects and perhaps there we can we can say that there are four sub varieties we are beholding processes of dialectic what i call dialectical speciation a common syntax a common syntax is interpreted differently in the interface with a phonological, the phonological component. In uh, an article with Glauber Romling da Silva, published in 2011, we showed how the same syntactic structure built on the strict relation between a head and its internal argument is phonologically interpreted by different prosodic structures, melodic structures, in Kuikuru and Kalapalo varieties. And this is the first uh, uh, element of verbal arts. So, exactly. That it's interesting to observe how the speakers describe their prosodic dialectical differences through metaphors of music and movement. Already we are before a native metalinguistic, metalinguistics sensible to rhythm, melody, already by itself, a verbal musical art of ordinary speech. So wrote Kaman, a Navqua teacher. So we have at the, at, the, at, the, at the left of these slides, the transcription in, in, in the orthographic transcription and then the translation. The way of being of our speech. Matipu, Kalapalo, Nafukwa speak of their relation with the Kuikuru language. Iheingo, Ihotago. That is why we say their speech is Iheingo, Ihotago left, crooked mouth, to Hengeri Kongo. It means as if descending a hill 
or when there are curves along the path. In the same way that we couldn't listen to our speech as Ijotado, Ijeigo, to Hengerico also, they hear a difference from their speech. We also speak and listen to their speech differently than our own speech. At the end, the words dance on different musics, on different rhythms, on different melodies. It's a just to, have, to give you some very few essential characteristics, uh, morphosyntactic characteristic of the uh, Upper Shingu Carib language, uh, of the Kwikwa Upper Shingu morphosyntax. Uh, there are, it's, uh, it's, uh, the morphology is highly agglutinative with some fusional elements. It's a final head language, final head syntax. It's a, a narrative language, agent subject of a transitive verb is the argument of, the posp of a postposition, the postposition hacke, this is locative postposition. And the absolutive argument and its head uh, constitute an unbreakable prosodical unity. There's just one set of prefixed person markers, no auxiliaries and no overt agreement. And nouns are naked. This means underspecified for number and def definiteness. This is for linguists, uh, just to, uh, for their pleasure, uh, to see which some very basic characteristic of, characteristic of the syntax. And this, this is the village of Ipatse today. And finally, we are landing in my place. We are landing. This is why our fi final land landing. This is an aerial view of the village of Ipatse today. This is a photo of this year, the very recent photograph, with the old and the new villages, one beside the other. And here I spend 40 years of my life and research. What I want I will speak here for, for you. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's not exactly a linguistic presentation. It's more better linguistics, much more an, anthropo an anthropological, ethnographical, and even poetical presentation on Kuikuru verbal musical arts. If you can identify uh, it, how the Kuikuru people identify a name, uh, their Kuikuru genre, the main Kuikuru genre of verbal musical art, there are four, the main ones. First of all, Edi, uh, or uh, translation, song, music. Anetti Tarinho, Chief speech, a type of a kind of sung speech, kehege, it's in Zoho, healing, witchcraft, spells, there are spells, sung, also genre of sung speech, and akinya, narrative, the art of the storyteller. I declare here my awareness of the always possible misunderstandings present in the translation from one language to another, even more. So when translation tries to be a bridge between meanings of very different cosmovisions. So I'm aware of the mis misunderstanding of translation. Translation is only a, 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 a trying. It's an approximation frustrating and melancholic approximation, approximation uh, as uh, Benjamin said many years ago, the philosopher Benjamin. The basic structure of the development of all verbal and verbal music art is represented in this figure drawn by an old masters of uh, uh, arts and of music and, and storytelling. The path, this, you have to follow this right line. The path, Enga, 
or base and its arms, its ikumu. This is the arms of Enna, its ikumu. Representing refrain, Enna, and variations, its ikumu. This is the basic structure of, of all verbal, verbal music, verbal musical, verbal arts, not just uh, of the Kuikuru, not just of the Apu Shingu, uh, but maybe we can find these kind of structures, all verbal arts of lowland South America and maybe uh, beyond. So these Itsikumu are the parts, the torts, variation. The parallelistic structures present in all arts of the world uh, construct themselves from the basis of repetition with variation, or better yet, micro variations, as we will see. Among the Carib peoples of the Apu Shingu, and among the Kuikuru, obviously, Tolo and Yamugikumalu are fists, dances, and songs interpreted exclusively or performed exclusively by women and that form a complex ritual and musical uh, complex in contrast or in complementation with the karutu flutes, karutu flutes. A masculine domain and prohibited to women. In Yamuri Kumalu, the myth of the hyper women is relieved, relieved, relieved. The metamorphosis that converted women abandoned by their spouses, by their husbands, in androgynous and powerful beings would, who touch the kagutu flutes with their swollen clitoris and in an exclusive, exclusively feminine village at the end of the world. This is the myth of the origin of the hyper women, of the hyper, of the Itaukwengo. During Jamoni Kumalu feast or ritual, women cast the penis of men called our enemy, retributing the insults that the men hurl against the vagina when they touch or when they play the kagutu flutes. Tolo, on the other hand, Tolo, on the other hand, are short sung poems, where instead of the name of an itseke, the spirit, hyper being, called or named by the kagutu flute, they put at the, at, at, at the, at, in the place of the uh, itseke, of the spirit uh, played by the kagutu flute, the name of a current or former human lover. And they sung to their lovers and for their lover and about their lovers, women. Tolo songs are, are therefore profane versions of kagutu plays. Differently from kagutu and jamuri kumalu, Tolo chant, Tolo songs are associated neither with shamanism nor with chiefdom. In the Jamuri Kumalu feast, on the other hand, the mythical events of the feminine rebellion that transformed women into hyper women, androgynous beings that exiled, exiled themselves to the end of the world. Having, having excluded men from their coexistence, are recreated. Various Jamurikumal songs live in the Akinya uh, narrative, the, the narrative of the Akinya of transformation, punctuating their crucial moments. But we will say specifically Tolo songs. The word tolo in Kuikuru means bird, uh, also pet, 
and denotes a determinate rep repertoire of women's songs executed in an, during the homonym ritual, the ritual with the same name, the Toll Feast. As such, the songs fly, or better yet, are made to fly, like birds. At the same time, the name Tolo can be the name Tolo can be used to refer to one's lover or beloved being, surpassing the domain of family and conjug conjugality. And when denoting what we call pets, the frontiers, the borders between human and non-human. So the lover, the beloved, is not the husband. It's a the Tolo song celebrate love relation, love encounters outside the conjugal, conjugality, outside the family. Uh, the lover or the beloved being could be also called his younger brother, or Tehaninya, which I translate as precious. Tehaninya literally means the one that is missed. The Tolo songs brings us to women. They only to execute them with a fixed repertoire composed of 10 switches, switches all in, in uh, around 400 pieces, which 400 songs, which correspond to all songs composed and executed uh, in some moment of the past by some women to her lover, or maybe migrated from another feminine fist, Jamuri Kumal. The Tolo thematized the relation. So we, we have here in these slides uh, the, the switches, the switch to, to uh, main uh, groupment of switches of the Tolo songs, these 400 Tolos are organizing suites of non-ordered song, Tape Hata Lingo, the two Tolo Tepe set and the Tape Tape Hata Lingo. In the, in the number is how many songs. So inside the Tolo Tepe suites, you have 95 songs. Inside the Tape Hata Lingo suites, we have 107 songs. And these are the switches of ordered songs, songs that must be executed in a precise and fixed order. Tinapisi songs. Tinapisi means, can, can be translated as be with nose, with a tip. Titalo, timungo, atzagal, agai mitoho can be translated for the Tuvira fish wake up at down. Can be translated for it be made to run. Nanana sogoko. Some of the switches are sacred. It means can, cannot be uh, reproduced. So uh, never can be documented, but never shown uh, to people outside uh, the Kuikuru, non Kuikuru people. The Tolo songs thematize the relations between men and women, speaking of Ajo, the lovers, clandestine loves, secret loves, jealousy, seduction, desire to escape, fears, conflicts between affiance, marital encounters and missing encount missed encounters. The authorship, the authorship of the Tolo songs was lost within oral transmissions memory. Characters are mentioned already at the limits of, mem of memory time. These, chants, these songs are executed by women in feasts, occasionally at the center of the village, erupting into masculine space, the village pl plaza, occasionally transversing around the circle of houses. The singers or eguinotto, owners 
or masters of songs, sometimes form a small group at night, sometimes, sometimes leading the village feminine collective in the most solemn and choreographed moments. The women are ornamented with masculine adornments and painted with anatu, with the red pigment of anatu. There are already when they sing and when they dance tolo or jamurikuma, the, the women cry and say to everybody that at that moment they are hyper women, androgynous hyper beings. The, the tolo and the jamurikuma fist uh, are punctuated with skirmishes between the sexes that occasionally become veritable small wars between sexes, where women and men provoke and attack. The first mock men for the aggressive sexual appetite violent, which causes pain, Ridic ridiculing major in Italia for its ugliness. Penis enters, violent, vomits, and become weak, faints, the women say. The men in turn respond expounding the reasons for which the vaginas is so repulsive for them with its smell, its humors, its hidden mystery, an interior which burns and is insatiable. Beyond this, the vagina is expensive, disproportionately expensive thus reminding them of the labor that men are obligated to perform in order to satisfy the so-called vagina payments, be it a son-in-law or be it a lover. The friendship and complicity of Wikuru women essential for my inclusion in their world was gradually consolidated together with the development of my communicative competence in their native tongue. Since my first, my first field work in 1977, a long time ago. The recording and the documentation of Tolo songs began in 1981, which the cont within the context of ritual performances. The Tolo were already present in my thesis in 19, uh, 1986. In 2003, around 20 hours of daily and nightly uh, uh, execution of Tolo were registered, registered in audiovisual format in the days and nights before the, and during the first great intertribal feast, Tolo feast. The entire corpus was documented as part of the project Kuikuru songs, in accordance with the request made by the Kuikuru leaders and chiefs to systematically register the entire repertoire of vocal and instrumental music. In this case, video recordings were of individual performances of a solo vocalist or singer outside uh, of ritual context, resulting in 13 DVDs containing the entire repertoire known by singers and Kuikun specialists today. Here in particular, we can offer, I can offer example of a vast internally complex repertoire of the 400 Tolo, Tolo songs compiled among the Kuikuru between 81 and uh, 1981 and 2003. With the aim of revealing its par parallelistic and recursive structure its poetics, poetic structure, as an illustration of a po possible uh, work of transcribing and translating this Amerindian verbal musical art form. The work of translation, I must say once more, does not constitute a mechanical transposition of semantical equivalence, semantic equivalence from one language to another. On the contrary, is an attempt to poetically recreate that permits for an appreciation of the original not so distant from the one lived by those who listen. 
enjoyed and were emotionally affected during the, the performance of Tolo song and of the Tolo uh, feast. So just the first, the first example of a Tolo song, just to hear a little bit. It's okay. Audible, more or less. Once more. So follow. I'm I'm following the lines of the Tolu songs and the Tolu poem with my cursor. Just once more. Well, I, I, I hope that was audible at least. Uh, this is, this is the, the translation, a minimal, a minimalist translation of this love song. The singer, the, the woman, the, the woman singing say, I languish, it is for the lack of Kalukuma her lover, I languish. It is for the lack of Ahiguata, I languish. This, there's two names of the same lover because each Kwekuru, each Kwekuru has two names at the same time. One, one received by the, the mother, 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 the other received by the father, father. But I skip this linguistic analysis just to show you that the linguistic analysis is possible just for these two lines of these uh, songs, of, of this song, of this poem. It's possible to extract many uh, uh, linguistic information like the order subject verb, like the existence of the postposition, like the construction of focus at the left of the left periphery uh, and uh, the very productive process, morphological process of verbalization of a, a non-categorized root here. But I want, want to try to skip and go on with the songs. This is now the songs, Tolo songs. And just to show you the beauty of uh, of, 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 of its poetics and the structure of parallelism, repetition with variations, uh, represented here by the formula, my formula, schema. Now with your tears, your beloved washed herself with hawk. Now with your tears, your beloved wash her, herself with hawk, with hawk. Now with tears, micro variation, you, your beloved wash herself, great hawk, great hawk. This is the refrain. With your tears, with your tears, micro variation, your beloved wash herself, great hawk, great hawk, the refrain. So this is to show the, the, the play of refrain and micro variation. 
This is another one. See if it's possible to hear. No? Maybe you can share your sound. What, Mina? Share, share the sound, maybe. <clears throat> There's a, from your computer. Mm. I, I have to have to go out from the the, the PowerPoint presentation or not. Uh, you might have to perhaps uh, Mark can help us. Well, uh, I suggest since we are live, I suggest that we can uh, we can try to hear it, but so far the people in the chat feedback that it's a bit hard. So eventually I think we may add the link to oh, some okay. more materials later on that we might have to go on with this <laughs> for now. Mark, uh, you cannot play it, Mark, from your end? Uh, I can't hear it either, and people in the chat say they can't hear it. I was thinking of playing it yourself. Because oh, from my side. side. Uh, could you... number two. Uh, well, I suggest we, maybe I can try at the end. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Let me see if it's, if it's better or not. No? Well, I'm very sorry. This is, I'm, I'm not, I don't know how to solve this technical problem, but maybe you can hear after through the link that Mark uh, Tang will share with all of you. So just more than, does a translation, more than Kaisa, my beloved, more than your beloved, my beloved, more than myself, my beloved. He's not like you, he's more than you, my beloved, more than anyone, my beloved, more than other people's my beloved, the exaltation of the lover. Another characteristic very interesting of um, uh, of uh, the Tolo songs in, in general of, of, of South American uh, Amazonian verbal arts are the embedded speeches inside the song. The existence of embedded speech, of embedding of voices inside the song in a so-called recursive structures. Like I sing that she sang that said that. Better to see an example. This is the, uh, a song by the, the sweet Algai Mitoho. In red, you have the embedded citation, embedded voices, embedded speeches. Go with me, come with me, go with me, my sweet love told to me, the precious man told to me, my sweet love told to me, come with me, go with me, come with me. I told to my sweet love, I told to the precious man, my sweet love told me, I said, Come with me, go with me, come with me, come. I told to my sweet love, I told to the precious man, I said. So we have here the variation, the figuration of movement, movement directions, coming and going. The lovers will go one, will go uh, in the direction of the others, attracted by the other. Since the place of the, the encounter was a great secret encounter be between the lovers was agreed upon previously directly or indirectly. These images are confirmed, confirmed in the recursive structure of the citation, embedded in turn, in, turn, in, para in parallelistic structure with micro variation, substitution or inversion. Embedded citation brings the speech of others characteristic of a large part of Amerindian poetics and Amerindian ecolalia. 
Others may be like here, humans, a lover or a dead, dead enemies made present by the voice of the singer or shamans as in many Amazonian shamanic songs. I think, Bruna, if you wish, before you go to this part, uh, Mark said that he has your sounds if you want him to play them. Okay. Do you want to, to play now? Yeah, if you want. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So could you jump back to the slide of the first song and then we'll try to play it. If it works, then that's it. Okay, so I'll try. Can you hear it? Could you hear it? Yeah, better. Okay, okay. Uh, could we have some feedback in the chat, please, to let us know if you could hear it? Uh, Amina, could you hear it? I could hear it. Uh, I, it was better than the first time, uh, but maybe if you play it a little bit higher, um, yeah, there, it would be okay. better. Okay, let me try again. Okay, so uh, I play it again, okay? Okay. Was it good? Yeah. Cool. I don't... Okay, nice. I, thanks. I have feedback from the chat that they can share it too. So nice. Do you want the second one too? Okay, so I play the second one. that okay? Was that okay, Bruna? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> okay, perfect. Well, the chat says that they could hear it, so I'll check with them again, but I'll let you go on in the meanwhile. Thanks. Okay, so can we, may I go? Yeah, please do. So what I would like to, to say now is about a discovery. The collaboration with, music, with the musician and musicologist Tommaso Montagnani, Italian musicologist Tommaso Montagnani, 
author of a thesis about Kukuru music, was fundamental and the reason for the discovery and analysis that without him had been impossible. We discovered a system of correspondences and oppositions between the songs, the Tolo songs, and the Kabutu male flutes, and the feminine you know, Tolo songs. The, to, the Tolo version, so it's something that I see uh, men's flute, the quick men's flute and women's voices, hyper beings and lovers. It's a poetics in a network of verbal musical arts between humans and its echo. The Tolo version of Kagutu pieces is not faithful to the model. The only, only material in common is the theme, as such the brief melodic phrase that initiates the piece and from where we find the proper name of a non-human in itseke, a hyper being, uh, a spirit, maybe the common translation is a spirit, but the, the translation I, I, I like is hyper being, mentioned in the origin myth of the Kagutu flute, or human beings in the Tolo songs. Just a parenthesis to elucidate the meaning of a crucial term in Kuikud and Upper Shingwon cosmology, it's a hyper being. Uh, commonly a Christianly translated as spirit. This is a good definition of what is an it's a given by the native, a native speaker uh, for the Kuikud dictionary. It's a is the one who eats us. It is uh, she or it isn't a person, Kuge. It cannot be seen. Itseke is the one that harms us with invisible arrows when we are sick. Itseke is not human, it's definitely defined by its predatory impulse. They are powerful, endlessly inventive, elusive, and aggressive. It is neither easy, not good to see itseke in ordinary, in ordinary life since we only see them when we are six or on the verge of dying. They are omnipresent present in mythic time. In historical narratives or everyday events, however, the category itseke is used as an explanatory shortcut for anything, anything strange or incomprehensible. The white also were for the Kuikur ancestor and still are for the oldest people it's sick. the white, no, we, white people, we are it's sick. So the theme of the pieces played by the Kagoto flute is also slightly different from the vocal feminine version. The Kuikuru says that it's the same melody, but in fact, in the women's version, there is a melodic development longer and more complex structurally and rhythmically. In the Kagutu version, the melodic uh, uh, fragment where the name of the itsek of the hyper being is heard in the flute sounds, flute sound correspond in the, uh, to the moment when in the narration that tells the origin of the Kagutu flutes, the hyper beings pronounces its name. The melodic fragment or the name of the hyper being heard and understood in the sound of the flute coincides with them, with that mo moment in the mythical narrative, the hyper being pronounces its own name. So, we see here the example offered is the nucleus of the piece Utigi uh, in the Kagutu suite played by the Kagutu flute. Utigi is a dog, dogfish itsek. It's a fish itsek, and it's a dogfish. And it dogfish hyper being. 
So do you see in the musical transcription, the flute in, in blue is where the flute uh, reproduces the name of the exec, of the dogfish hyperbeam. Uh, now let's see if it's possible to hear the flute. Justice. Okay, to see this, this is the name. Ta ta ta, utigi, utigi. This is where the flute play. Place the name of the dogfish hyper being that is substituted in a tall corresponding tall song executed by women with a lover name. So here is the trans musical transcription of the corresponding tall songs where the phenomic and melodic fragment is transformed and where the flute uh, play very simple or more simple melodic phrase, uh, it's substituted by the more complex melodic phrase with the human character, the human personage of the lover now called Uguta Hutaki catfish mouth. So you have an explosion of melodic complexity in the women songs, in the tall songs. Hugutaho Taki is the proper name of the personage of the narrated song event with what could be an extreme contraction of the narration between backstage, backstage and background. A woman, a woman calls her lover for a clandestine meeting, a clandestine, a secret encounter. She is with her little sister and she plays, let's say, a double translation of, uh, a double meaning of uh, the word tolo, lover and pet. That which was the name of a hyper being is converted in the name of a lover called to by the woman in the first song directed towards him and then sensitively cited and reproduced tirelessly by the lovers. The examination of the supposed melody identity between the tolo, the tolo songs and the Kagutu musical piece reveals a musical transformation, which of course is a result of an of extremely complexity of the tolo song. We have therefore a partial but precise correspondence between the male flute piece, piece and the corresponding women's song piece and the explosion of new melodies in the song in the feminine invention. Mutual develop, musical development results from the presence of a text from the, the reciprocal adaptation between words, sentences and, and musical structure. And this is the corresponding tolo song of the Utigi uh, flute piece. Come to see our beloved pet or pet, catfish mouth. Our beloved is swallowed my, with my youngest sister. Come to see us, come to see us. In summary, the tolo songs are translation of the intersemiotic nature of the Kagutu flute songs, profane counterpart of the shamanic sacrality of the masculine flutes, whose sight is also strictly prohibited to women. The same structure of the named groups and the sequence of Tolo songs assume the also named groups and sequences of Kagutu, song, Kagutu music, Kagutu pieces. 
we found ourselves, therefore, before two genres grouped in a transgenre, subdivided in subgenres, with each subgenre subdividing in named suites, suites and ever suites formed by sequences of pieces. It is fundamental to follow the vocal and instrumental script as well as ritual actions. The court execution of sequences in the pieces and suites is the condition for the beauty and truth of the sound movements, essentially for ritual agency. Many tall songs have a theme of, as a theme, efforts, emotions connected to clandestine secret passions of the lovers of the adju. It is the melancholy of missing a person, the impulse toward the escape. Extra conjugal relations form a complex webs of exchange, feminine sex versus masculine presence and payments. As the Kwekuru say, the vagina is expensive and beloved. The goods acquired by women in their amorous encounters are in sequence immediately placed in circulation in a sort of ritualized market called uluki, exclusively feminine. So just to say some example of these themes of the Tolo songs. One is desire, nostalgia, missing. Ahinyo Quero, those from there cut your hairs there in the village plaza, fallen on the mat. This song is a representation in brush strokes of the event that marked the departure of the young women of Inyokuero from puberal, puberty seclusion, reclusion. The public cutting of his hairs that intact since the beginning of his seclusion already cover his eyes and back. The scene is viewed through the eyes of someone who either loved her clandestine, who either loved her uh, secretly or wants her now as a woman, as a wife. The second is the below. I still have the still little piece of wood of your, your uluri, the little piece of wood of your, your uluri, so that I'll miss you, so that I might use it as an earring. The man has a fragment of the uluri of his lover as a me memento of his meeting, of his encounters. The uluri is a small feminine investment, a tri triangle, made out of bark that covers the vaginal slit, held by beauty wires that surround the hips and penetrate the buttocks. In graphical representation, the uluri is seen as, as a like of cash sex, a feminine cash sex. In graphical representation, the uluri is seen as an integral part of a feminine genitalia, never repre represented as naked, but it's always in some fashion dressed, covered, domesticated. For men, the luri is the vagina. This is perhaps the most beautiful song poem of the old Tala songs. Just three verses, three lines, repeated countless, countless times in its expanded structure, activating an image that says everything. That winds be born on us. In the palm of your hand, I will duck, I will land like a hummingbird. So this is just a scene, uh, just a moment uh, it's, that is absolutely meaningful of the love of these secret lovers. Another one, let's bathe, said to, said to me my lover, wash me and remove a little of my smell of copaiba. Wash me and remove a little of my anatu. My brother, my younger brother said to me. So my lover said to the woman, go, let's bathe, 
based together secretly. So just two verse, verses in which uh, a lover asks a woman that she speaks and in love, this, this one, uh, the, this first tolo, the first tolo, tolo poem here. Let's speak raspingly, I said to Nini Cuero. This is repeated endless time. Just two, two lines in which a lover asked a, a woman that she speaks in a loud voice, that he cannot speak in a loud voice, cannot speak in a loud, cannot speak in high voice, that she, she must speak in a loud voice so that no one will listen while they love each other in hiding. And below, one more. It's me. I'm not the monster Hahasa. It's me. I'm not Jamatua. It's me. I'm not a ghost. It's me. The lover, the man, saying these in low voices to her, uh, to her female lover. Uh, during the night outside the, the house just to let him enter and have sex with her inside the house. Yes, let, let's another song, let's put in puts on our necklaces. Only after may you burn me. Wait, I want to bath. I want to paint myself. Only after may you burn me, not now. Yes, let's put, our, let's put on our necklaces. Only after I put my necklaces on. The man animated character of, the, of this song Asks, asks for his anxious lover to wait for him to make himself beautiful. Only after may she burn him. If the penis punctures the vagina, Ipolo, it is in turn burned by the vagina. So it's like uh, the sexual act uh, the two sides of the sexual act between lovers is 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 uh, named uh, among the quikuru. Desire for escape, another in the last team. Let's escape at Tahukula to the headwaters of the world. Let's escape at Tahukula, where all waters begin. Let's escape at Tahukula to the headwaters of the world landscape at Tahukula. Hagita, let's escape. It's another song. Hagita, let's escape both of us far away. So what so that we may love each other. So that you so that you can love me forever. Another song on the desire of escape. I'll go with you, said to the woman to me. On a canoe, she went away in front of us. So the song, the Tolo song as such, appears to permit a transition from the more private conversational genre to a cathartic, cathartic and metaphorical discourse made public. Here, music is an operator of transformation, not on the cosmological or ontological plane, but in between modalities of communication. As it's as if it were possible among the Kuikuru to dramatically reach through song, license to say a truth, always dislocated and unreachable through naked speech, the prosaic, through prosaic speech. So they say you can uh, the Kikuru say, you can say singing what you cannot say speaking. Sings through the song, the gossip, 
misleading speech, speech par excellence can become loving affirmation. Just to finish, to conclude this, this, uh, this uh, adventure uh, through the Tolo songs, uh, through this opposition, poetic uh, opposition, ritual, poetic, sung opposition and relation and asymmetrical complementarity between men and women, between sex genders. Uh, this, this excerpt from uh, the text of Vittorio Lingiardi is a philosopher and poet, Italian philosopher and poet that it seems to me very uh, interesting. Poetry fits on disorder, but it serves to shape, contain, uh, the pain. It's an interruption of disorder. Poetry is a break of confusion. Without loving movement, without, this, without loving movement, without desire, without fear, without abandonment, abandonment, the verse does not arrive. And when it arrives, the disorder disappears. So that is it a nice uh, concluding comments uh, on, on Tolo songs, on the, the universe they represent and they animate. I don't know if I have time uh, to, to talk about, yes? So this is, uh, Let me speak briefly of another genre of quick cool verbal music art, art the Anetti Taguinho, the chief speech. I will present just a short excerpt, excerpt of the culminating discourse of the Anetti Taguinho, the chief speech, a sequence of six ritual discourse performed by the chiefs during the main intercommunities festivals or feasts in the Upper Shungu, the celebration of dead members of chiefly lineages known as Kwarupi and called Eritsu in the Kwikuru language. In this intercommunities context, the chief speech, the Aneta Italiño, is a sublime icon of encounters and reciprocity. It is an example of covert and presumed dialogue between a conspicuous lock locutor, a chief here. You see the chief here, uh, executing the, 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 the chief speech. With its, for, its formulaic, formulaic oratory and an interlocutor who is mute or limited to prefabricate prefabricated expression. This is that the almost mute interlocutors. Who are they? The almost mute interlocutors of the chief performing the chief speech are the messenger, all of from chiefly lineage, who come from another community with the mission to invite, in this case, the Kuikuru people to uh, Kwarupi festival, to an Eritsa festival. The chief speech, Anetti Tarinu, has, has been considered in many ethnography as incomprehensible. In order to understand and translate the special language of the chief speech, we need to go through the historical narratives used by its masters as an adequate exegesis. And we'll see that the outcome of the recent archaeological research of the, on the Kwikuru territory and which and complement the native exegesis of Anetti Taninu, of the chief speech, through the identification of physical features and places of the Kwikuru cultural landscape. At the start of uh, the 80, last century, 1980, it was already possible to detect symptoms of a decline in this, of the chief speech. 
For the old masters, it is more and more difficult to find apprentices to whom transmit their specialized knowledge. The Upper Shingo network is fed mainly by the performance of these long ritual cycles, like the Gitsu, uh, that prepare for their culmination. Festival of rituals of inter-tribal, inter-communities ritual, whose cosmological meanings, mythical foundation, choreography, songs, dancing, and speeches constitute the relations between the local groups, the local Otomo, local socio-political entities, village, villages in space and time. The chief's ritual speeches, as we'll see, are, cele are a celebration of the history of each group, of each autumn. Only the main chiefs and some few elders of an already autonomous local group or village know the chief speech and have the ability to perform it during the big inter-community rituals. Only these authorities can claim direct descent from the founders chiefs who lived between the 18th and the 19th centuries. Doing so, they formally confirmed that their local group, their village, is a true member of a supra-local Upper Shingo society, the multilingual and multi-ethnic Upper Shingo system, and then able to make alliance, alliances and exchange goods, songs, women, and narratives. In the Anet Italiano, the chief speech is a form of genre, chanted, rigidly formal like, versified, densely metaphorical. It is the clearest vocal manifestation of, chiefly, of a chiefly status, and it is characterized by rhythm and expressions not used in everyday speech. Prosodic features identify this chanted speech the rhythmic unit represented in a description by lines. I can put all here. So the chief speech is a sequence of formulas and uh, characterized with prosodic features that identify this genre of chanted speech, sung speech. The rhythmic units represented in the transcription by lines succeed each other with the same melodic and tonal shape, a monotone broken on the verse last syllable by a lower tone. The, the overall perception is of the equal repetition of the same prosodical pattern, anchored in a non-ordinary res respiratory rhythm. Formulas are constructed around key words which contains dense and nuclear meanings. So I'll try to play I don't know. Let Possible to hear something? I So, because the voice is very low, the voice of the chief uh, in this genre of uh, ritual speech, of ceremonial speech, very low. It's, it's very difficult to record in the actual performance. So this is the excerpt of the concluding welcome speech performed by the chief at some distance from the messengers. Very difficult translation. I tried, and this is the result. You still run for nothing, messenger. It's as along the chief's path, run, messenger. It's not along their path, still run, messenger. You should be running this way, messenger. So you say to the terminian oku, the messenger, is the last word of this line, is the rhyme. The first verses open the speech with formula saying that messenger 
ataco, run, travel along the wrong path, Ima, since there are no more chiefs like those of the past. So the rhyme of the verse, as I said, is given by the repetition of the term Inoku, the one sent by a chief, in other words, the messenger. So pay attention, the images of connecting paths, so we have, which is the nucleus? It's run, messenger, path. The images of connecting paths are contemporary and they come also from the prehistoric period. In comparing recent settlements, this is the main imma of the Huikuru main village. Look, this is big road. This is the main, connecting the Kuikuru village to the other village, neighboring villages. In comparing ancient and recent settlements, contemporary village look like just prehistoric plaza, except that the residential areas are reduced as much as 10 times or more. This is just, just, sorry, this is just another view showing the, the, the main imma, the main path and secondary path, secondary imma, departing from the Kuikuru village. So in comparing ancient and written settlements, contemporary villages look like just prehistoric plaza except that the residential areas are reduced as much as 10 times or more. Based on long-term ethnoarchaeological research, the ethnoarchaeologist Michael Heckenberger has reconstructed the form and dimension of the prehistoric villages in the Upper Shingu, much bigger than today's settlements, surrounded by fortified ditches and linked by straight wide roads. The pattern of Shinguano village location over the past 140 years documents that certain localized areas have become the location of concentrated occupation over the long term. It's also clear that there are few areas of the landscape that remain untouched by the great chiefdoms of a few centuries ago. The first village of Kufikuru this is the prehistoric Kuhiku village. And these are the historical uh, village. And this is the, the size of this contemporary village. So note uh, the, the reduction. No? The first village of Kuhiku and the actual village of Ipatse were built on prehistorical galactical sites of the 16th century. In the following part of the Chi speech, yeah, uh, great ancient chiefs are mentioned one after the, uh, the other in a fixed order. I have no time to show the other excerpts of the Chi speech. But just to what I, I want to show you is uh, that these are the Imma. This is the exegesis of this meaning of Imma of, of road, of path, that is just uh, depicted in these in this, uh, lines in the verse of the chief speech. In order to understand what does it mean, messenger, you still run for nothing. Messenger, you, can, you must run along the chief's path, etc. So the exegesis of this very uh, difficult uh, to understand uh, ceremonial speech uh, can go through the landscape, through the archaeological and historical investigation. And also the akinya, the narratives, stories, are fundamental, are crucial in order to understand the uh, 
Annette is telling you the chief speech. So num um, numerous supporting and parallel Akinya narratives are played out in storytelling by the masters of storytelling, the Akinya Otto, also as exegesis, as exegesis of the Annette Tarinho, of this chief speech. As we could say, everything has Akinya. Narrative of beside everything. Akinya is uh, the root inside the word Akinya, narrative, is Aki. It's a root, Ugh, translatable as word or language. And especially as an exegesis of the Anetti Taguinho, of the chief speech, are historical narratives. So the distinction between mythical and historical narratives, it's not easy to do. There's, it's a border absolutely subtle and porous between this subgenre uh, uh, of, of narrative. Shinguano narratives have a temporal complementarity. On the one hand, they report and reflect happenings in the dawn time, a mythical time, that is a mirror world that the shamans visit in trance and people and their, in their dreams and provide the foundation of the actu actual history of the chiefs and local groups. On the other, other hand, they refer to the continuity from an historical past and existing reality. The two dimensions, mythical and historical, bleed one into the another the tiny borderline between what we, we call myth and what we call history exists in some way, but it must be redrawn from another perspective. Among the historical, so the historical narrative, just the, the, the unique uh, characteristic uh, of the historical narrative are the presence of these two uh, uh, words of this two morpheme, one ke is um, an adverb with a past tense meaning, but also with a, an authoritative voice, epistemic meaning, a kill that's in an, an enclitic to uh, VP, to the verbal phrase, uh, also uh, with the remote past meaning. meaning. Another uh, epistemic or evidential morphemes uh, present in historical narrative is Tiha, when the storyteller uh, states something that he witnessed uh, of first hand. As first hand. Among the historical narratives executed as exegesis of the hermetic chief speech. There are those that recall the raids by slave raiders and explorers who exterminate villages as well as persecuted, killed, and captured their chiefs between the second half of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. A clear connection exists therefore between the origin of the local groups of the local villages and the white people. Linked to the mythic cosmological symbols, we find historical and geographical references across time and space. With a diminished population after the attack, raids and successive waves of epidemics, now we are seeing the, the last wave of epidemics with the COVID-19. But with the diminished population, after the attacks by white people, the historical Kohikuru and the Patsa settlements were and are like the shadows of the glorious distant past. Initial European colonization in South America during the 16th century and after 
had predictable consequences for native people, catastrophic depopulation and cultural, cultural disruption. I would like to conclude this presentation with the last line of the narrative told by the chief Atafulu, the great chief Atafulu in 1982 to me, uh, as an exegesis of the chief speech of Danetti Tarini. This is a very long narrative covering at least more than two centuries of history. At the end, this is the, the, the last line. It is, it is, it, this narrative tells about from the raids of, of, of 16th and 17th century until the beginning of 19th century. Uh, so it's long, uh, long last memory of, of centuries. And the, the, at the end of, the, of, of this Cagayapa Kipugu, the arrival, the arrival of white peoples, this is the title of this narrative. It's, each narrative has its own title. Atahulu said, white people persecuted and killed. They killed and they reached. Then our ancestors continued to run away. White people killed us and we moved from a place to another. Now we are here after so much suffering. You are always taking our things, our land. You live where we lived a long time ago. Your ancestors must stop to take our land. You have taken most part of our land. This is the, the, the end of, of, the, of this narrative. So you have here just in red, uh, the, this morphine characteristic like kill and wanke characteristic of historical narrative. You never find these morphines, kill and wanke in mythical narrative. So it's like some, something like a, 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 a marked uh, definition uh, of what we can consider and call historical narrative uh, contrasting with mythical narrative. So despite population inside a diminished and closed territory and cultural changes, now today, the Shingwan society, the Kwikuru people survived and still survived. And I, I hope that you can, all of you that can, can see and feel uh, this life, this surviving and this resistance and resilience of the Kwikuru people, of the Upper Shingon people and of all native people of uh, not just South America, not just Brazil, but all South America and all the Americas. And this is, is the end. Uh, so, thanks. Upuguhaigei. means this is the last. Merci and thanks. Obrigada. Merci. Thank you. Obrigada. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for this uh, talk. Very deep, very um, complex about poetry from the different genres, the different populations. Um, I'm first going to read the names of the people who listened to the talk and were saying hello to you. And then we'll see if we have questions and if we don't, I have some myself. So there were uh, Marianne Mithun who said, hello, Tom Durand who was here, uh, Felix Ameka said, bonsoir and salut Bruna. And uh, we also had Neige Rochon, 
Sharon Rose. And uh, Anthony Struthers Young. And those were those who interacted in the chat, but of course there were other people who were not interacting and who listened to your presentation. Thank you so much. So uh, I, it doesn't look like we have many thanks from the audience. It doesn't look like we have questions. So I'm going to ask you my questions if you if you're okay. So uh, you said at the beginning that there were various dialects and they were characterized mainly or mostly or saliently by their different prosodic um, features or contours. And you said the syntax was quite similar, but the prosody was different. Does this reflect into the various uh, Tolo songs or Tolo kind of melodies that, that you have in the various villages? No, because in the in in in, in song, uh, in in songs and also in uh, in the chanted in some speech like the the chief speech, so the two major song song on one side and uh, sung speech. Uh, you have like a neutralization of this micro variation because the, the dialectical differences are neutralized because are overdetermined by a melodic structure. But the melodic complex uh, structure of songs, like the Tolo songs, or the monotonal uh, melodic structure of lines, uh, in the in the chief speech in the sun speech of the chief speech of the Nati Tagini. so music music uh, present in different ways in different modalities in songs on enchanted speech in, in sung sp enchanted speech our music is a uh, has the power to delete in some way differences and put allowing different people, women, women, men, different local groups, different villages speaking different languages, not just not just different uh, different dialects of the same language. Uh, to, to, to put in, in, a, in the same melody, in the same rhythmical uh, transmission, the same rhythmical communication in public uh, arenas, in public places, in public encounters, in public meetings, where differences must be uh, in some way diminished. So music has also the political, if you, if you, if you want to say, a political uh, effect to a political, it's a political tool you know, that permit the, 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 the meeting, the encounters between uh, others between different people. Men and women are so different as uh, Kalapalo and Kuikuru speak in different languages or as Kamayura speaking the Tupi, Tupi Guarani language and the Kuikuru speaking speakers of a Carib language. So there is a kind of sublimation of audible prosaic linguistic difference in these common melodies. And when you have, for example, uh, the, the photographs, just, just to show 
because this is interesting here. So the chief is, is, is uh, performing the Annette Itarinho, the chief speech in Quicuro, okay? The messenger here, Aikamayura, they speak a Tupi Guarani language, a genetical different language. And they, there is, there are in some moments, they react, they react with formulas, with formula-like -like expression uh, in Kamayura, in their own language. And when and so you have as it's some, in, in some moments you have at the same time the chief uh, speaking speaking in uh, the chief speech in Kuikuru and the messenger uh, speaking the the, the formal like uh, responses of the of the messenger in Kamayura to completely different language. They don't understand they don't understand each other, but they understand it that just perfectly because they know that there's a commonly a commonly uh, knowledge. A commonly knowledge. So here also so we have here you know, at the end you can hear a polyphony of different languages. Kuikur and Kamayura, a Carib language and a Tupi Guarani language, spoken, not spoken, chanted at the same time. Uh, but so you, you can hear the difference, but you can hear also a same rhythmic, melodic performance. It's okay. I, yeah. I can. I think you, and, and so the messengers will carry the song to another place or carry the, not the song, but the song performance or the message to someone else? How does it work? Yes, after this, after this, they came to invite the Kuikuru for a big festival, a big inter-community festival in their village, the, the Kamayurala village, not so far away, but not 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 so near. Uh, maybe fifty kilometers from the Kuikuru village, fifty. And then here, what, what is doing the chief? The chief is uh, receiving is a reception moment. So this is his, he's performing the ritual reception of the messengers, the inviter, the, who is here to invite the Kuikuru people through their chief, their main chief. And then after this, this is the hours, hours and hours under the sun without moving, listen to all the sequence of Anetti Tarinho of the Chi speech speeches. And after this, at the end, finally they can uh, they are feed, they are uh, they receive the drink in manioc made with manioc, and they can bread and, and fish, manioc bread and fish, and they immediately must leave from the Kuikuru village. And, and this is our, this is our, the same messengers going away from the village with manioc red fishes uh, given by the chief, the Kuikuru chief. So they are leaving to their Kamayura village. And there, at their village, at the, the Kamayura village, speaking in Kamayura, a Tupi Guarani language, a, a Tupi Guarani language, a different, genetically different language, they will tell to everybody in the village uh, how was uh, all the all the all the all the, the ritual invitation, what happened, what they saw in the Kuikuru village, 
a lot of gossip and a lot of, of uh, small, minor stories. This is the communications among village. So a perfectly, it's a perfectly uh, efficient communication, even with this mosaic of uh, linguistic diversity. But there is a cultural, a cultural, especially a ritual, uh, common language. That the communication is possible because upper Xinguan people share the basic feature of the same cosmovision, culture, and social political organization. And this is interesting because the multilingual and multi ethnic upper Xingu system uh, has no lingua franca. Okay, there is no lingua franca. There was. There was no lingua franca. They never need, never needed to develop to have, uh, to try or uh, to uh, elect to select one language, one language as a lingua franca. Now Portuguese is a kind of lingua franca. Now we can, if in the last from the maybe from the 80 of the last century. Uh, now we can say that Portuguese is a kind of lingua franca, yes, in the upper shingle, but not just in the upper shingle, ev everywhere, everywhere. The bilingualism in Portuguese and one or more native languages is growing, it's, it's uh, absolutely growing. Uh, it's a threat for, for the surviving of indigenous languages, uh, obviously, but, uh, but new languages are, 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 are appearing. So you have the, 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 the Kwikuru uh, written in, in Facebook, in Twitter, and then in, uh, in, uh, in Instagram, they, Kwikuru young people are absolutely addict of social social networks, uh, so and they use their their language and they use the Kwikuru uh, in their communications. Uh, it's 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 a new life for the for the Kwikuru. Mm -hmm. It's a new life. It's a different, full of, of 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 changes, and you have a lot of borrowing, not just lexical, some grammatical borrowing also from Portuguese. Uh, that are borrowing that are now absolutely uh, uh, absorbed uh, in the Kuikuru, young Kuikuru dialect variation, dialectical variation. But it's it's a, it's a, an injection of li of new life for a language for indigenous language in the, this new context, in new context of interaction of uh this is not the, not just the village of the indigenous territory but there's the uh, the context the uh, national context regional context global context they are they are they are in the network they are the social network social media they are absolutely uh presenting the social media and they use their language there when they don't want to be understood by others uh, but foreigners. But even so, it's a new life for an, for a new a new variety of the language, mm -hmm. and it's it's good and it's not it isn't good at the same time. I'm I'm old, I'm Niholo, like the Kwikuru says. Niholo is almost an ancestor. And uh, the Niholo people uh, don't like uh, new things, new uh, transformation, change in general. It's, uh, it's an old people way of, of being, uh, but it's, 
it's how the, the life is. Mm -hmm. And um, I also had another uh, question about the, the, the solo songs. Um, are they uh, passed on from generation to the next or do, do we have, or do you have uh, new songs coming or Im improvised songs or some singers who invent new solo songs? How does it work? It depends from the genre. So tolo, tolo songs, the tolo songs repertoire. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that in English uh, it's a repertoire, I suppose. A tolo songs repertoire is fixed, traditional, and not submitted to any innovation. Uh, but Jabo uh, Kumalu songs, uh, the other uh, women uh, uh, ritual also is a fixed traditional uh, repertoire. But there is one genre which generally are fixed repertoire, very fixed, very. Uh, sometimes it's, it's few differences between one tradition to another in the transmission from a master and his or her apprentice. But in general, is is our fixed traditional repertoire that must be protected and conserved and transmitted as they are by tradition. But you have another genre, by, for example, it's called Kwambu, that can be um, the Kwambu songs are songs. Uh, the Kwambu songs are could be traditional. So you can it's, it's an it's an to, to, to sing a Kwambu song is an individual decision. So it's 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 in the, it's also it's an individual performance. Uh, so if I want to, uh, in the ritual, uh, in the Kwambu feast or ritual, I can sing a, an old Kwambu song already sung by a Kalapalo chief or uh, Nahukwa uh, woman, but also I can compose my own Kwambu song. And uh, if people like this new composition, they can adapt and sing the same composition in the following uh, Kwambu uh, feast. But I can, all day, all my song can, can die, can disappear at the moment. It's, and I can sing, I compose my song because I want to talk to everybody, and, the, the, and I want that everybody listen to some problem. Like I want, I, I need to defend myself from sorcery accusation, witchcraft accusation. I want to, I, I want to accuse someone of sorcery accusation, uh, witchcraft. I want to, like Tolo, there is also, also there is a, a not so uh, clear border between Tolo songs and Kwambu songs. So I can, but it says it's, uh, it's Kwambu songs are mainly uh, performed, composed and performed for political reasons. I want, I need to defend my family. Uh, I need to accuse someone in order to defend myself. And I want to say something about uh, the behavior uh, of some people in the village. Uh, I want to denounce, uh, or I want to talk about politic, um, uh, uh, politics. So, for, for example, I can I can I can compose a song on Bolsonaro. 
if I want, I can do this. The next combo, I will sing on Bolsonaro. I will compose my song on Bolsonaro, on the, on the government, Brazilian government, or on the indigenous policy in general. So, and so it's, it's a repertoire constant, constantly renewed, constantly. Uh, but this is a characteristic of the Quambo songs, of these specific, specific genres of songs. There are 13 rituals or feasts already performed among the Kukuri, 13. Each one has hundreds of songs. So you can imagine the immense patrimony of, uh, of traditional knowledge of songs. That's why it's so, why so, so, how, why so many songs, so many rituals, because this is, uh, to, to make ritual, to make a feast, to, to sing and to dance are the main, um, the main path in order to maintain the, co the community of a village or the relationships between villages, between communities alive. Uh, Feast, Ailene, in Kuikuru language, is also Requilene. So to dance and to sing and to do, to participate in feasts, to perform feasts, to perform rituals, are uh, Requilene. Requilene means health, well being, and happiness. It was, it is what maintains people together, together. So this is a real lesson for life at uh, the moment and uh, a very beautiful ending for, uh, for your talk. And uh, we're very, very grateful to be able to understand perhaps a little bit more about uh, these very rich and vibrant cultures of the Amazon. It's really incredible, the wealth of uh, songs and everything that you just showed. And uh, we are humbled by this and we hope the best for all those cultures and languages in the near future. So many thanks to also all the people who watched us and interacted through the live chat. And um, I suggest we meet again next Thursday, not at eight o'clock, but at seven this time, um, French time, for an interview of Professor Marianne Mithu from the University of California at Santa Barbara, who will tell us about the fascinating indigenous languages of North America. So see you next Thursday, I hope. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you very much to all of you, to Amina, to Mark, and to all, to, to those who has the tolerance to listen to me, to, to listen to my Portilianish, it's not English, uh, and to this uh, not so, uh, a little bit chaotic presentation, but chaos is life. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. I think we, you, you gave us um, a view of the subtlety and the depth of those cultures. I, I think everyone who listened and tried to understand the, even with the limits of the translation that you underlined for us, um, I think it was possible for people who love poetry to uh, get a little bit of this meaning and uh, depth that you have shown. Thank you very much. Thank and you. See you next um, 
next Thursday. I'll just share our final screen. And thank you, everyone.